The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So welcome to everyone this morning to the Buddha Loka Buddha Centre and to the Buddhist Society of Victoria. So today we will be uh, uh, continuing a uh, talk, continuing a theme that I um, started with in November, I think. I started in November. And we can see is a tree, and uh, a tree with roots. And maybe people, do you remember what the tree with roots was meant to be about? Do you? So this is, this is the, the most important thing with this picture is, are the roots, because the Buddha has a teaching on the roots. And uh, trees need roots to sustain them and to give them stability, to hold them up. Um, and in the same way, our mind needs to, is sustained by positive roots and also impacted, we say, impacted, how to put it actually, by negative roots. So we have, the Buddha said, three roots, there's more than three roots here, of good or um, the positive and three roots of the negative in our minds. Every human being has, every unenlightened human being has this. So that... Uh, this is part of it. There's more than six roots there, you can see, but <laughs> that's the way it goes. And so the reason for this a series of talks was because I was, uh, be, have been reflecting on climate change and the environment, and everybody says, where is it coming from? What's the, you know, what's the source of it? What's the, uh, the, root, of the pro root of the problem? And of course, most people come to it quite naturally. They think, well, it's in our, our minds, actually the source of that problem is through our greed, particularly our greed, but hatred and our delusion. So these are, I thought these were very important things to look at because often we don't look at them in um, any depth. And when we use the words greed, hatred and delusion, people often think, well, I'm not greedy. Other people are, but I'm not. But gre greed is any any uh, shade of wanting, of any shade of desire. So it can be very mild, you know, it can be, seem very, um, very uh, insignificant. And the same with hate. When we use hate, it sounds like, well, I don't hate people, you know, or maybe only a few people. <laughs> they deserve it, that sort of idea. But most of the time we do have the other aspects of the negative states of mind, like irritation, annoyance, uh, maybe jealousy, revenge, things like this are in the mind. So we may not think of them as hatred. And of course, delusion. Nobody, uh, it's very hard for people to get a handle on what is delusion. So today's talk, <laughs> we'll be focusing on delusion, so we'll, we'll get an idea of what, del of what talk about delusion. And we can, actually, it's very good to ponder it because delusion of course is the complete opposite of the Buddha's teaching. This is what he's, he's aiming at reality and delusion is all about not seeing reality. So the three, the three roots as I mentioned, greed, but there's also the good story, the good part of the story is that there is also the wholesome or the positive as aspect of or opposite non-greed. The Buddha calls it non-greed. Very scientific sort of terminology really. But this encompasses any of the positive states of mind, particularly giving and generosity, loving kindness, compassion, any of the uh, states of mind that um, are the opposite of greed. And so many things are being thankful, being content, these things. Because when we're content, we don't need to get. We don't need uh, if we're really content, we don't need anything at that particular time. We're just happy to be here, as I often use that, that, uh, that phrase. And also hate and aversion, as I mentioned, any shade of hate and aversion. But there's also the opposite of hate and aversion. And of course, the most direct opposite is loving kindness, is compassion, equanimity, this uh, evenness of mind, and also joy with other people's, other people's successes. So this is the opposite. And delusion, of course, um, as I mentioned, as a negative um, quality, but as a positive quality, is understanding. It's developing our wisdom and seeing things as they truly are. And of course, in a Buddhist context, what is seeing things truly 
as they truly are. It's seeing, it's having right view. It's also right view, samadhi, seeing things according to uh, reality. And particularly the Four Noble Truths, we often mention that. So these things are all coming from seeing things as they actually are. So, it's interesting to ask, well, what do we think uh, delusion is? I think it's an important thing to ponder. Because usually people say, well, I go blank <laughs> when they talk about delusion. I, I just don't know what it is. And so uh, I, like, I like to think of it as asking, this Ajahn Brahm often expresses it like this, just asking from the world what it can't give. Asking from the world what it can't give. Because it's just not the way reality is. Or we can think of it as fighting with reality. And of course I always say to people, who do you think will win? <laughs> reality does. <laughs> it always does. So for me, this following uh, video is a very, very good... Uh, can we have that one, Langdon? Yes. It's a very good a dramatic uh, illustration of our endeavour, what we're trying to do with life. It's quite, int quite funny too, I think. Do you think he'll ever win? <laughs> so we see him trying to push the waves back into the sea, you know, he's trying to do the impossible, he's fighting with reality. But when I first saw this, a monk sent it to me actually, he was in India at the time, so I presume it's from India, and uh, I don't know the story of this person, you know, whether, whether he was uh, doing it to make a point, or whether he was crazy, or uh, any of these things, one can't tell, or on drugs maybe. But he was very, very serious about his endeavour to push the waves back into the sea. But we are doing the same with reality, actually. That's what I thought when I saw it. I thought, we're fighting with reality. We're trying to push the waves back into the sea and asking from the world what it can't give, you know, that the waves will, will uh, go back into the sea permanently. So this is, this is part of delusion, not seeing things as they, as they actually are or really are, the opposite of wisdom. And the Buddha had a lovely saying for, for this, it encompassed a lot of things, actually, but all aspects of delusion are really covered by it. And he said, whatever you think it is, the reality, he actually says, it is always something different. It is always something different. Whatever you think it is, the reality is always something different. So this is the aspect of delusion, not seeing things as they actually are, not seeing reality, fighting with reality. And for him, the things, um, I'll go into it in a little, bit, uh, a little bit more detail, but particularly for him, seeing the, this body and mind in, in, the, in a way that is not in reality. So particularly our ownership of the body and the mind is what he's talking about largely. But it covers all the different aspects that I'll, I'll mention in a minute. So we can ponder, what do you think the Buddha meant? <laughs> By this, I gave you the answer a bit then. And uh, a lot of the times we are very much uh, imprisoned by the way we see the world. And the Buddha called this uh, views or beliefs, uh, opinions, our perceptions, is a, and thoughts of how things are. And we tend to see the world through those categories. Some of them we've, we've actually taken on board without really... Um, being aware of it, actually, and one of the uh, one of the books that I, I read it years ago, so I don't remember it very well, but that puts this very well, I think, was from Krishnamurti. Have you heard of Krishnamurti? And he had a book, famous, his most famous book, I think, is called Freedom from the Known. So we think we know, and therefore we don't investigate because well, I know what it's all about, you know, and so this is. Um, what we tend to do due to our views, opinions, beliefs particularly are very good at that and also because of that perceptions and our thoughts as well. And the interesting thing with this uh, quotation, you know, whatever you, whatever you think it is, the reality is always something different. It's meant to be something like a riddle, 
you know it's meant to be something that encourages us to look into our lives you know you know and th because most of us think well i know what reality is about <laughs> you know i know what it's all about so it actually challenges that and uh, makes us look deeper and uh, so, so we can uh, hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, a very good ex example of this, a story I'd like to use is a Nazarene story. Nazarene story, you know, we, how, we, how we view the world. And this, maybe you'll be able to relate to it. I, I can. And one day Nazarene was, he was taking his donkey, because he had a donkey and it was the main form of transportation in those days, TNT for, for, <laughs> for, for Nazarene. And he was carrying, one day he was carrying salt with, on this donkey to the market but he had to go through the river and the donkey went into the river and that, the salt before that was really heavy he was overloading his donkey <laughs> and he went into the river and as soon as the donkey got into the river the salt started to dissolve he got lighter and lighter and he came out of the out of the river feeling very happy very light and very frisky he thought wow this is great Nazarudin wasn't so pleased <laughs> because he had nothing to take to market now. <laughs> it was in the river. So, but the next day or later, he was going to market. But this time, he was carrying wool with him. He was carrying wool with him. And he came to the river. And the donkey thought, oh, great. This will be really good. As soon as I get into that river, great. It will be really, really good. I'll feel much, much better because I'm overloaded with this stuff. Got into the river and it got heavier and heavier. And he got to the other side and he was virtually staggering to get out of the river until the water drained somewhat. And then he could go to the... And then the, and Nasruddin took him to the market and, and little by little got a little bit lighter as he went. But this is the way we, we are. With, we think things are going to be one way, you know. We think, ah, oh, it's a salt, salt day. <laughs> salt, it's always going to be salt. But often it changes and it's wool, sometimes it's wool. And we, we don't, this is the reason we, we, have, uh, we have dukkha in many ways, because we don't move with the change that is a part of life. And this is, this is what's coming, isn't it, in this discussion. So sometimes people say, what, uh, what things are we deluded about? Uh, what, uh, what wrong ideas do we have? And I would say, for any, everyone who is unenlightened, what are we deluded about? It's really everything. <laughs> everything. It's pretty much everything. It's uh, sobering. Because if we haven't reached a stage of enlightenment, we, we're not actually seeing things as they are. We'll always be at one remove. Of course, the closer you come to the Buddhist society, the nearer you're getting to seeing <laughs> how things actually are. That's the idea. So we hope that, uh, you know, to improve our vision by using the Buddha's teaching, to look in a different way and to uh, and then thereby actually develop that ability to calm the mind. This is always the way of the Buddha, to calm the mind, to make it peaceful and strong and so that it's got that ability to look into experience. And then using some of the Buddha's teachings, some of the guides, they're only guides, then we can look deeply into it and see what we see. Uh, and hopefully it will be similar to the Buddha. Our words may be different, but it has to be our experience because the Buddha's experience, the Buddha's understanding, his wisdom, his knowledge is his. <laughs> We're just borrowing it. <laughs> We're just borrowing it. And there's a nice um, uh, quotation I like from Ajahn Chah about delusion, which puts it very well, and it ties in really with the, uh, the three roots we're talking about, or really the six roots, because we're not only, talk not only talking about the negative side, talking about the positive side as well. And someone commented to Ajahn Chah, and I think many people can relate to this one, I can observe desire and aversion in my mind, but it's hard to observe delusion. Do you think that's the case? Yeah, most people will say that. And that's, that's actually quite true in a way, very true. But Ajahn Chah, being Ajahn Chah, he replied, ah, he said, you're riding on a horse and asking, where is the horse? <laughs> <laughs> because delusion, because um, 
this uh, uh, desire and aversion this person's talking about, they are delusion. They're the expressions of delusion. What comes out of delusion? Because it, without delusion, we wouldn't think these things were worth desiring. We wouldn't uh, be uh, chasing after them. And the same with aversion. If we didn't have delusion, we would not have aversion to other people, to things, to situations. We would accept them as they are, knowing they have their um, conditioned uh, a reality for them, their conditioned character, you could say qualities. And so the things that we are deluded about, of course, just heard, you know, aversion and desire, so the our defilements are very much part of delusion. And they can only work, really, if there is delusion there. If, if there is this sense of a self, particularly, that, that, that's what enables a lot of it. I need this. I want to get rid of this, this person, this situation, all these things. I own this, all that. But in particular, we have uh, also delusion about how our bodies are and uh, our minds are. More the delusion that we own the body, you know, we own this body. That's a biggie. But of course, as we get older, we, we, get, <laughs> we get quite a few reminders, actually, that we're only, as somebody said to me, just had an operation uh, for cancer, and he said, oh, he's hoping to get a new lease of life. And I said, ah, that's exactly it. We, we're only leasing the body. We're only, <laughs> it's only on lease, actually, and the owner will one day take it back. And the owner, of course, is nature. So this is, is part of it. So this is part of our delusion that, you know, we think, well, as this mind is inhabiting this body, it must be mine, you know, my body. But, of course, the Buddha said, you know, if it were our body, then we could wish it, tell it to, to not grow old, not get sick, be like this, not be like that, and uh, make it the way we wish. And he said, this is not possible. And, um, and so he is emphasising the aspect of non-self, that we don't own the body. And the same with the mind. And this is more difficult for us to see. But the mind is a, you know, it's a conditioned phenomena. It's, when you use these words, conditioned phenomena, it's more like it's, it's a set of programs or habits that we've developed, qualities we've developed. We haven't developed them. We've been influenced by many, many sources. You know, the, our far parents, our teachers, our, our, the people, our friends, by the media, the time we live in, the culture we live in, all these things influence um, our minds and how we see things. And of course, you know, we also, um, w the way we look at the future, the past, and even the present, you know, there's a lot of delusion about that. And so much of the time, how much of the time do we spend tr trying to fix up the past? It's happened, <laughs> it's gone. You know, and uh, so this is one of our delusions. And about the present, the future, of course, you know, trying to... When we try and fix up the past, often there can be a lot of... It can give rise to depression. We think, it's always going to be like this, you know, I'm like this, and this situation is going to continue. And uh, also for the future, we can be very fearful and anxious about the future. We can also be very excited and stimulated. That's possible too. So these are all aspects... Of, of delusion and uh, one of the biggest ones of course and we can talk about that in more detail is desire or, or we call it tanha you know craving they say in, in Buddhist uh, uh, English and so, so much of that is delusion that this thing that we want so badly this person, this situation, this job whatever it is you know is coming from this delusion you know that uh, and that we'll be happy once we get that. It'll be very fulfilling. And uh, this desire is the ultimate con person for us. It keeps us wanting again and again. It keeps us going back to Chatston, as I keep <laughs> mentioning <laughs> again and again. I mention often. But the Buddha's actually, his, his biggest uh, teaching on this, uh, the, on uh, the delusion in a sense, um, he always talks about, you know, that we are in samsara, that we are blinded by ignorance. You've heard this, blinded by ignorance and fettered, you know, chained by 
tanha. So this is what I was talking about. By desire, by this craving. These two things are like the ball and chain around our ankle. And blinded by ignorance. Ignorance is another word uh, for, they often say actually, for delusion. We call it avija. And um, it's another word for delusion. But... I think a good case can be made, or I feel it's the case anyway, that delusion is more the active, um, uh, active process of ignorance. It's how ignorance is perpetuated, because the ignorance that the Buddha is talking about, particularly, is the ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. That's the, the, way, the nature of reality. So he has a teaching, and he calls it uh, the distortions of reality, distortions of reality. This is called the vipalasas. People heard of the vipalasas? It's a famous, famous teaching, and it's in the numerical discourses. And this is what we are adding unknowingly, in a way, often unknowingly, to reality. Um, and as you'll see when I go through it, it really corresponds to the three major insights that... Um, that uh, bring the understanding of reality. And those three insights are impermanence or anicca and dukkha, or I'd say unsatisfactoriness, not getting what we want. <laughs> and also, uh, third one is non-self or this selflessness, that there isn't, uh, as much as we'd like, a permanent me inside here who's doing everything, pulling the strings, making things happen. And this, this process of distortion I like to, uh, uh, came to me this morning actually, I thought, oh yes, yes. It's like a light going, you know, you have a white light or, you know, it's just the ordinary light, going through a prism. And once it passes through the prism, what happens? Colours, Colours rainbow. Yeah, it's like a rainbow. People say, I like the rainbow. But this is, this is the process of distortion in a way. I thought this is similar to it, that reality is like this white light, but once it hits the prism and goes through, the prism of our minds, prism of prism, not prism, prism of our conditioning, the way we see the world, then it becomes these different colours that, uh, that we like, actually. Sometimes we like and sometimes we don't like. So that's sort of an image for this distorting process, the vipalasas. But as I mentioned, um, there are uh, four aspects that the Buddha points out, and they're good to look at in, in our lives. And one of them, the last one actually, is, is one that is very, uh, very obvious in our lives. And I'll just, hopefully I have a few minutes to talk about it. And the first one is, of course, as I mentioned I've been sort of alluding to, is taking things to be permanent or lasting or stable or reliable, dependable, which aren't, can't be. And the Buddha said, everything that's come into existence is of this nature. It's impermanent. You know, and we can see that with our bodies and people say, oh yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> no problem with the body. Or, um, but with the mind, maybe not so much. And the Buddha is talking about this impermanence not only, um, you know, our lifetime. We can see, you know, when we were young and we were children and then became adults and then we aged and we got sicknesses and, and we've seen people die. So we see that process is very obvious. But the Buddha is also talking moment by moment and in his experience he said one of the marvellous, wonderful and marvellous qualities of the Buddha was that he could see his feelings, perceptions and thoughts as they arose, as they remained changing and then passed away. So he could see impermanence on that level, which is really, people might not think that sounds like a big, something big, but it's huge because we, how many of our feelings, perceptions and thoughts do we catch? Just a few, just a few. And he was seeing them all. But also being a, a Buddha is someone with this sort of huge knowledge and I often think of when he he mentioned he was in a forest one time and he picked up some leaves from the floor of the forest on off the ground and he said this is what I teach these handful of leaves but what I know is the like the leaves in this forest but these leaves in my hand are useful 
for people to practice and useful for attaining liberation from samsara, attaining liberation from the negative states of mind, for attaining wisdom, understanding of what existence is about. So these are the few leaves that he was um, teaching, but very useful ones. And all the other uh, distortions that I'll mention really are based on this impermanence because this impermanence, nothing lasts and nothing stable, is the building block, as it were, <laughs> building block of, uh, of existence. And once it's like that, m many other things are affected, everything else is affected by it. And so these are, um, I'll mention these as we go along. And the Buddha gave a very nice uh, teaching when he was the Bodhisattva and he lived in a palace and uh, he was living a very, um, you know, he describes it. He says a, a very delicate life. That's the translation. They have very, very um, wealthy, uh, luxurious life with three palaces for the different seasons of the year. And he was reflecting then, and this is amazing for somebody who's living in the lap of luxury to really reflect deeply on life. But of course it's coming from his past lives too, you know, that he would incline that way. And he was reflecting on what he called later, he called the three intoxications. Do people know those? Three intoxications, the mudders, I think that's, it's called in Pali. And the first one, because he was young at that time, is the intoxication with being young. And I was asking the teens group last night, do you think you'll be young forever? <laughs> they said, no, 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 no. I don't think that. I think they do think that. Though. They can't comprehend a state when they're not young. And you can't, really, until you, when you're past it. And you think, oh, no, I'm no longer young. And... Uh, so he, he reflected that for him, and he was young at the time, you know, so it just shows the wisdom that it is, uh, it's not appropriate for him to be, uh, to, to be uh, uh, negative, to, it says things like to be disgusted, humiliated by the sight of old people, <laughs> an old person, because I am of that nature too. So he was reflecting, bringing his reflection back to himself. And he said when he thought like that, he said, this intoxication with being young, being young forever, f uh, dropped away. And he said, when people have this intoxication of being young forever, they can do anything by body, speech and mind, of course, but through greed, hatred and delusion, these three roots that I'm mentioning. Um, because they can be very, they think, well, you know, what's the big deal? I've got, I've got a lot of time ahead of me, you know. And uh, so youth is one of the uh, things that people get intoxicated with. I think many of us here may have got over that one. <laughs> may have. I certainly have. <laughs> Life wakes you up, actually, and tells you, yeah, no, you're not young now. But it's still surprising how sometimes you see people and they, you think maybe they think they're still... 20 or something, either way they dress or, or the, the language they use or the cars they drive, that sort of thing, you know, they often seem to be, be uh, at, at odds with their actual age. So it's quite interesting to see. The other intoxication that the Buddha mentioned, and it's one that we can all relate to, is he mentioned that health is an intoxication. We can think We'll just be healthy forever, you know. We'll, you know, and we also think, like Ajahn Brahm says, when we get sick, we think something's wrong. This is not normal. <laughs> but as Ajahn Brahm says, yes, you should go to the doctor and say something is right. I'm sick. I'm sick again. So when the Buddha reflected, you know, that he shouldn't be uh, upset, he shouldn't be disgusted and humiliated when he saw sick people, you know, that. He said this uh, intoxication with health was abandoned, let go of. And, and, he, and this is amazing for somebody who is living in a lap of luxury. And uh, this, in a sense, too, relates to the stories we have of the Buddha seeing the, uh, um, the old person, the sick person, the dead person, and the holy person. So this is quite interesting. And then he abandoned the one with health. And the next one he reflected on was that it was not right for him, it was not appropriate for him to be intoxicated with life, to think 
this is going to go on forever. This is, and I can do whatever I wish by body, speech and mind and from uh, greed, hatred and delusion. Because he, he said, having seen you know, people who have died, is it right for me to be upset, disgusted and humiliated when I have the same nature as these, these persons who have passed away? So that in he said when he reflected like that, and he was the bodhisattva, he wasn't enlightened yet, he abandoned this infatuation, or there's another word for it, intoxication with life. So this is youth, health, and life, the things that the Buddha talked about. It, But it can, corresponds to our reflections on, uh, that he gives in other places on old age, sickness, and death. And these are, what are they? They are impermanence. We can see it in our lives. We can see it. So now I'd like to go to the next, the next one, which is, uh, and you're welcome to join in with this one when your number comes. I think you'll soon work it out. It's a really good idea. Order. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. 16, 33 55 71 72 73 74 75 76 77 77 and a half 78 79 80 81 82 83 84 85 86 87 88 89, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Good. Isn't that a good, good way of presenting it? Some of them were very lively the way they said their number too. <laughs> I like 77 and a half was a very popular one, wasn't it? I thought he's in denial. <laughs> but that's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's very obvious, impermanent, uh, and uh, that nothing lasts, that we're, the body is ageing uh, before our very eyes, as it were, in the mirror. But we don't notice it, actually, when we're looking in the mirror day to day. And it's often interesting when I meet friends I haven't seen for a long time. I thought, my goodness, they've got old, haven't they? <laughs> They're really getting old, and then I, then I reflect, maybe I have too, <laughs> but I'm just used to it. So it's very good when we see this, and of course, to me, you know, it's a real teaching that uh, what is important, what is uh, in our lives. We can ask ourselves, what is important? Is it the body or the mind? And we can see the body getting older and older, but the mind, of course, need not go down that pathway. 
of, of uh, deteriorating and ageing. Of course, we have very commonly now, we have uh, Alzheimer's and uh, dementia. People talk about that a lot. But of course, you know, we can uh, develop the mind uh, and, in, and in, in many ways, if, the, if we develop meditation, mindfulness, these things, they can be very helpful for uh, avoiding, or maybe avoiding or reducing the effects of dementia or Alzheimer's and these things. And also a Buddhist perspective on those, and Ajahn Brahm, it's very interesting what he says about this. He says, you know, these dementia and Alzheimer's, this is a um, part of the problem with the, uh, the base, we would say, the, the root for the mind is the brain. If the brain is not working, then the mind cannot operate through it very well. But the good news with that is when the, when the, the mind separates from the body at death, the mind won't take that brain with them. So we are very hopeful that somebody who has no idea who people are, and their relatives are, their son, their daughter, and so on, when they pass away and move on to their next life, if they can remember their previous life, they'll know things clearly. They won't be in a completely befuddled and uh, um, unmindful state. So this is, this is a, a good, a good, good news. <laughs> good news. Good. But as I said, we can do things to, and people rec uh, recommend that, don't they? To keep the mind active, give the mind exercise so that we can avoid uh, or reduce the effects of these uh, Alzheimer's or dementia. And of course, the way we look at reality is a very important part of that too. So the um, next area that the Buddha talks about, naturally enough, after we have impermanence or a Nietzsche, what would be the next area? Dukkha, yeah. So he's talking, here he's talking about happiness, but it's both happiness and unhappiness. And of course, this is, I mean, everybody can see it, can't they? The distortion in our way of looking at things is very obvious when it comes to happiness. The things that make me happy are probably not the things that make you happy and your neighbour happy. The things that make people here happy will be very, very different. So it's not in the nature of those things that happiness. We are providing. This is an add-on. <laughs> We're adding on to our experience. And for, for, for us, um, for one object won't arouse the same feeling of happiness. It will not be seen as a pleasant thing necessarily. So you can, one of the best examples these days, because very polarised in the world, is uh, Donald Trump. The reactions to him are various, very wide reactions. Same person. And also we can reflect too in terms of distortion. When I was young, and we didn't have Lego then, we had Meccano then, I loved Meccano. I wasn't very good at it, <laughs> but I loved making things with this, as kids like uh, making things with Lego. But these days, I haven't got the slightest inclination to take out my Meccano. You can't get it now anyway. Or Lego. I'm not interested. I don't have the time. And it's the same for all of us, that the things that we found to be happiness throughout our life, it's changing all the time. And this goes right up to, you know, the, our partners, our relationships, you know, at different times in our lives. The, the dangerous time for, for us, of course, is teenager t into the early 20s with relationships because we take them so seriously and we think this is a make or break. If we break up, this, my, my world is destroyed. And this is very dangerous for, for young people because we have that high incidence of suicide and often because of things like this. They're broken up with a partner and we know, you know, when you, when you have lived longer, you had more experience, you know, these things can change in our lives. And not only that, our attitude to our partner can change <laughs> as we see in our lives, you know, that, uh, that as we change, the relationship changes. So the person that we started out with may not be the person some years down the track. And then people can break up. Then they uh, can go their separate ways. So, of course, you know, the, the things that we found to be happiness, they are impermanent too. They're changing. And it's good to remember we too <laughs> are impermanent as well as these things. And 
because of that, you know, we it makes us it should make us more aware that when we desire things very strongly, that these things which they now I'll make you happy, I'll make you happy. I think that's a song title too, actually. <laughs> uh, are actually impermanent as well. So they're so important for now. I have to have this relationship. I have to have this uh, new phone or new whatever it is, new car, or new house, new relationship. But in actual fact, it's all impermanent. And this is a very good way for us to let go of things when we contemplate. When you're in Chadston <laughs> looking at something you cannot afford, but you think you have to have it, have to die for it, they say. And then if you think, if you can just see that thing, you know, in maybe a year's time, all broken down, not working, or torn, or whatever. And with that image in mind, it can help you let go. We call this actually a suba in a way. It's seeing the, it's actually seeing in accordance with reality as, as well. And the third area that the Buddha mentioned that we uh, distort reality with, and this is in the area of seeing things as either beautiful or uh, we could say ugly, but unattractive, beautiful or unattractive. And this again, like happiness, is very obvious too, because we have that saying, don't we, uh, in English at least, I'm sure it's in every language, uh, that the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the person who's seeing it, and that will be different for each person. Of course, there are these people that uh, uh, universally thought, well, often, you know, a large number of people think are beautiful. So we have these supermodels, whether they be uh, women or men, that are considered to be very beautiful. But in essence, in actuality, their bodies don't differ anything, any at all from the other people's bodies, except in terms of the shape, the outward appearance, the colour, that sort of thing. That's the big difference in terms of beauty. Uh, and of course, we see, you know, beauty is very culturally um, uh, determined too. So in, in many countries in Asia, for instance, to be very fair is considered beautiful. Very fair, to be fair is considered very uh, beautiful. So this is a cultural thing, actually much more a cultural thing. And as somebody pointed out to me, often people are thought to be beautiful because they're fair, but actually their features may not be as good as other people's features, balanced and, you know, very uh, pleasing looking, but they may be darker. And so that's beauty and unattractiveness. They have distortions we bring as, as uh, is happiness, unhappiness, as is permanence and impermanence. But another, as the biggest aspect, of course, to the whole equation we, uh, that we need to... Uh, the Buddha is often focusing on is this sense of me, I, mine. You know, this is a really something that really is is a, is running our lives. Actually, this is how we we uh, operate from. This is what gets so hurt and upset when <laughs> when people say and do things that we don't like, and uh, it's something that. Uh, uh, that we f it feels like such a reality for us. So for when we hear from the Buddha, there is no lasting self, that this, what we take to be ourselves, is actually a work in progress. We're changing all the time. And uh, the qualities that we are, are developing are changing all the time. And of course, we hope we are <laughs> changing for the better. But some people aren't actually changing for the better. And uh, particularly if people don't have a teaching that points out the nature of reality, that the difference between what is wholesome and what's unwholesome, what's positive and what's negative. Because then they can develop things. How do we develop things? Just repeating them again and again. If we repeat good things again and again, you know, for instance, we're very generous and kind, and we get a real habit for it. Fine, there's no problem with that. That's going to take bring happiness for us. But if we get a develop a habit of uh, of being stingy and mean, and we, you know, we think, well, we've got to look after ourselves, and we hoard things. We see this, don't we? See people who hoard things these days, and we can realise this is not going to bring them happiness. But they are repeating that uh, the thinking, underlying thinking, which says. I needed all this stuff. I can't let go of it. I can't give it to somebody else. And of course, in the process, they're finding they live a life that's not happy, that's full of fear, because if you've got all this stuff, 
Somebody may take it. <laughs> and of course, somebody will take it. What will take it? Death. When you die, you can't take those things with you. Which is just as well, otherwise it would be pretty messy. <laughs> so, so, the big point for the, uh, the sense of self is it's not a permanent thing. This comes from Anicca. We want it to be lasting and uh, um, solid and obvious. And so people do all manner of things to, to give that impression. And it's really only a pre impression. You know, they'll develop uh, a mass, a lot of wealth. Some people are incredibly powerful. They'll have a lot of possessions, property, that sort of thing relationships, and they'll have a lot of experiences. And when we do all these things, we feel like, I'm more real, I'm more here, and look what I've got, you know. And of course, this is um, an illusion because all that goes when we pass away. And so it's, it's really looking at uh, the real things that are useful in our lives, are developing the good qualities you know, the good karma, we would say, to the good actions of body, speech and mind. And these good qualities we can take with us when we leave this life. That is useful, very useful for us. And another aspect uh, I'd like to mention in terms of self, and this is, this is a deeper level, because the understanding of the, the view that there is a self in here is completely destroyed for a person who attains the first stage of enlightenment. They know, oh no, there's no permanent me inside. And far from becoming depressed, overwhelmed and uh, whatever, they th they're very happy. It's very liberating to think there's no permanent me in here that's running the show. And what they, how they uh, come to that is they understand that their, their body and mind is a conditioned phenomena. It's something that's come due to causes and effects. It's arisen due to influences, due, due to the programming, due to the habits they've developed. And this is what we've been calling, that we call myself. But this person has seen at a very deep level, there is no me that's running the show. And they see what we call Paticca Samapada, and this is dependent origination. How things arise from a cause, and they give rise to an effect, and that effect becomes the next cause and keeps going. There is no self there. They've seen that. And that destroys that idea that there's a me in here. And of course, when it destroys that idea of a me in here, there's so much less to protect. There's so much less that we need in life. So immediately someone sees this through this view of I or a permanent I, permanent I or me inside. Their desires and aversion greatly reduced, greatly reduced because the, the sense of an I is what makes desire really work, is what, what makes uh, aversion really work, those negative qualities. But the Buddha has a deeper level, and this is, this is only realized by a person who, realize, who uh, yeah, realizes the third stage of enlightenment, anagami, and he calls this conceit, we call it mana, mana. We have it in, in uh, Sinhala, actually, and it usually means pride, I think, pride, mana. But uh, it is this comparing of ourselves to others. And it's comparing ourselves, thinking we are better than others, or we're the same, or we're worse than others. And this is, this is something that gives so much suffering in people's lives, isn't it? When we compare ourselves to others, you know, especially, you know, if we feel like we're better than others, maybe that's... Uh, uh, that we feel good about that, perhaps, but there's always the fear that there may be somebody who's better, you know, whether it be someone who's better looking. You know, this is something that uh, people are concerned with very much: is their looks, their appearance, especially when they're young. They're very much concerned with it, and so they tend to compare themselves uh, with other people, particularly these super models, these models, these singers, and so on, uh, and. Uh, that uh, they can compare themselves with, and also, of course, will come off second best because they've got a lot of makeup on. <laughs> they've got a lot of makeup on, and the lighting's good, everything's right. So it's uh, that's the interesting thing, actually. They say when you meet some of these supermodels in in da daily life, you wouldn't know them from uh, from anybody else. Some of them, I think. 
So better to have that very natural beauty that comes from within, actually. So, so th another other aspect that people often is their intelligence. That's what they often compare with others. You know, I'm not smart enough, or I am much smarter than those people, and uh, they develop this sense of self based on that. But this is at a very uh, refined uh, level in terms of the Buddha's teaching, going very deep. The person who breaks this will be the arahant, not the anagami, the arahant. This is a fully enlightened person sees through this. And what it's failing to see is that actually what we're comparing ourselves to others is like comparing chalk and cheese. They're different. They've got different qualities. They've got a different background. They've come from uh, different lives. They've had different life experience in their past lives. So it's comparing things that are really not comparable. And, uh, and in, in the process, of course, we see when we do compare uh, people, we, we develop a lot of these negative states of mind. You know, oh, I wish I was like that. I wish I had blonde hair or I had this or I had that or I was smarter, or all these things, and we wish we were. Because then we think, uh, I could really be happy <laughs> if I had these things. And of course, that's not the case. That's the, the con man again. But just to finish off, I won't, uh, and with, oh, that's good with an Asruddin story too, to, to talk about the process that creates this. This is actually probably more important then uh, it, it, well, just as important really is th seeing that those four areas of looking for permanency in what is impermanent, looking for happiness in what is not uh, happiness, looking for beauty in what is not uh, beautiful, and looking for self in looking for self in what is not self. And the process for that the Buddha talks about is uh, threefold. He says because we have, and this is the, I call it the process of delusion, it's creating our ignorance, or, or uh, what you say, uh, repeating it, reinforcing it perhaps, yes, reinforcing our ignorance, is we have views and beliefs and assumptions about how the world is, how we are, about everything actually. And some of these views, and uh, most of them actually, uh, are not necessarily useful for us, especially if they're negative about ourselves. You know, sometimes people have, from a very early age, you know, from their parents, from their uh, teachers, from their friends, uh, uh, from uh, society, you know, from media, from uh, from newspapers and so on, they may get the impression that I'm I'm not clever, I'm not smart, you know, and they have this view which they may have taken on very early. You know, you might be in kindergarten, kinder, as they sometimes call it, and people have told you, oh, you're not smart. Well, your mum and your dad said, look, you're not as good, as smart as your brother is, or something like that, or your sister. And so one can take on a view like that, and without really investigating, is that true? Is that really true? And then that can influence one's whole life, actually. One can feel, for instance, that happiness would be mine, if only I was smarter, I could work it out. Uh, I wouldn't have this unsatisfactoriness we call dukkha in my life. And so there are many of these programs that go on, and they're not only about ourselves, they're about our relationships too. That my, you know, the classic ones, my father or my mother, they didn't love me. And, and that can really run through our lives so that we have chronic insecurities, fears, um, uh, maybe abandonment issues, those sorts of things. So these views, we call them views, they can be beliefs, and they're often assumptions. They're not questioned, and yet they're running our lives. They're actually controlling our happiness. And we, we very often we may not even be aware of it. So it takes some reflecting on, you know, to see what, what views um, or what beliefs, assumptions about myself and about the world am I running on? And are they as useful or not? You know, are they giving, bringing me happiness or are they creating a lot of unhappiness for me? And reflecting on the power of views or beliefs, there's an Azarudin story and it's almost the end. So, And one, one uh, day, uh, Nasrudin's, yes, Nasrudin's uh, a neighbor saw Nasrudin uh, outside his house scattering something around his house. And it was towards the evening. And he said to Nasrudin, what are you doing? 
He said, I'm scattering, I'm scattering breadcrumbs around my house. Oh, he said, that's very interesting. Why, uh, why are you doing that, Nasrudna? And he said, ah, to keep the tigers away. And his friend, and his friend the neighbour said, but Nasrudna, there are no tigers in this area. See, I told you. <laughs> And that's how our views work too. They're very, you know, we, we take them and we, they, we see them fulfilled. We say, oh yes, I'm not smart. I'm not clever enough. I'm not good looking enough. But that's not the end of the picture for the Buddha. We've just nearly finished the end of the picture actually. Um, because of those views, we start to perceive things that way. What does perception mean? We recognise things, we see things that way. So if we think we're not clever enough, we're not good looking enough, we'll start to see plenty of proof of that. You know, those people are not interested in me because I'm not good, uh, uh, good looking enough or I'm not smart enough, that sort of thing. I didn't get that promotion because I'm not smart enough. All these things... These perceptions tend to build and they, they're based on that view, that assumption, that belief that we started with. It's the wrong assumption and the wrong belief. And we can get this about people too. We can have a view of a person that this person is my enemy, they're the worst person in the world, you know, and so on. And, and the perceptions will develop like that as well. And we can see all the proof, you know, of what they do and say, yes. 100% that they, they're evil incarnate, we say, evil incarnate. So these perceptions, I like to play with perception because perception has this quality that uh, when we perceive something, when we see something, when we recognise something, we're 100% sure that's true, that's real, that's as it is. And I love it when I perceive things and it's not that way at all, you know. And just classic things, you know, like the other day I was walking and I... I just saw out the edge of my eyes, I saw something on the verge. I thought, is that a person doing yoga on the, on the verge? <laughs> I thought, that's really weird. Then I looked, no, it was just a piece of paper actually <laughs> folded over. I thought it was a yoga posture, actually. I, thought, I could have also thought, you need new glasses. <laughs> but it was a really interesting perception. And you see that very common ones uh, when you see somebody at a distance and you, you get all these feelings and thought, ah, oh, it's... It's uh, Evelyn. She's, ah, oh, look, she's coming. Oh, good, good. And you get close. No, it's not Evelyn. <laughs> it's some other woman, completely different. So, so these, it's, you see the power of perception to make us really believe this is true, this is real. And based on that, we'll think about uh, these perceptions, we'll think about the, that come from those views, and then that will again reinforce, yes, I'm not smart enough. Yes, I'm not good looking enough. All these things will be reinforced. And it just keeps going around until we investigate that view, until we develop meditation that allows the mind to develop some strength, look at uh, these things in some depth. And then we can see this view is not true. It's not true at all. And we can ask ourselves when we look at these various views, you know, is it true? And then we can think of, how do I feel when I have this view or this belief about myself or other people? And then we can ask ourselves, how would I feel if I never had this view of myself? You know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not good looking enough or I'm not smart enough. How would I feel if I never had that view? And of course, it's a very open, uh, positive, sort of light experience compared to that view. So these are ways we can investigate our views and see through them so that we can not believe them. This is an important thing. If we can see them happening, if we can recognise them, that's okay. We don't have to operate on them. But if when we really see through them, when we really develop wisdom, then we will let go of them completely. And we'll be free of those views that limit us and create a lot of our unhappiness in life. So I'd like to finish this talk on delusion there, talking about the, uh, the negative root of delusion and hopefully to a certain extent about the positive side, wisdom that uh, sees through delusion, the light that's turned on and banishes the darkness, as the Buddha would often say. So may we, uh, may we see delusion, may we see the horse we're riding on for what it is, and not believe some of the things that delusion is telling us, and thereby find happiness, peace, 
and wisdom in, in the process. So thank you very much for this morning. There we are. So, so that was delusion, the third route. I finished the series. <laughs> good, good. Right, are there any questions or comments? Just a few minutes and then we have to go over for the shared meal. You better get in quick, there's three online questions. Right. Oh. We have a number of questions, so I'm going to, I hope the questioners don't mind if I join two of them together because they're very similar. Ah, that's good. good. It's really about, is it possible to achieve the goal of liberation or enlightenment without being a monastic? Oh, right. Is it possible? As a lay person. Right, right. Thank you for that. Is it possible to achieve the goal of liberation without being, uh, while being a lay person, without becoming a monastic? Sorry. Um, of course, it, it is. And they say up to the third stage of enlightenment. In the Buddhist time, we hear of people who were the third stage of enlightenment, anagami, just the stage before becoming uh, fully enlightened. And they say, often they say that uh, when a person becomes fully enlightened, then the only purpose for their existence is actually to teach and to, um, you know, to help people out of compassion, actually. Because a wise person is very compassionate because they, they've seen their own foolishness and the suffering that that's brought. So then when they understand things, see things as they actually are, they're very happy to share that with others if they can. So the natural consequence of that is to become a monastic to become a monk or a nun uh, because that is quite a, the best vehicle, best uh, avenue for it, actually easiest avenue for it. But certainly to become enlightened is no problem as a lay person, first stage of enlightenment, second stage and third stage. But they usually say for arahant should become, well, will, an arahant will become a monk or a nun. And they have some sayings that if you don't, you'll pass away in six days. But I don't think the Buddha said that actually. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, it's a comment. Uh, I am a Muslim, but I am interested in Buddhist mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. How can I convert to Buddhism mm -hmm. and become a good and successful Buddhist teacher without being a monk? Oh, right. Right. So there, is a, there is a post comment from someone else mm -hmm. on here that just says, uh, it is possible to be a Muslim and a follower of the Dharma at the same time. I don't know if you'd like to comment on that as well. Yeah, no, I think that's quite true, actually. You know, one can use the principles. Uh, dharma or Dhamma or Dharma is, is really, you know, the nature of reality. So it doesn't have any brand loyalty, really. <laughs> but we, the Buddha really ex expressed it and described it, uh, his own experience, very, very clearly. But it can be used for... Any, any of the religions, you know, can use those, those, those uh, uh, aspects of reality. And particularly, you know, developing loving kindness. We have all, all the qualities that uh, we need to become enlightened. Every being has that. So it's possible to uh, have, uh, to develop this in a, a context that's not necessarily Buddhist. But um, the... Taking refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, of course, that's a real step in one's life. That's converting, actually. And that is really um, probably increasing the power of that intention in a big way, you know, to go towards enlightenment. Because most of the other religions, to be honest, they don't have that on the agenda. If you want to be a Christian or a Muslim or a Jewish person, you want to go to heaven, you want to be with God. If you're a Hindu, you want to be at one with Atman. Um, so these are all different objectives, really, and so enlightenment is not necessarily part of that idea, that uh, goal, as it were, of those traditions. So uh, that's something to bear in mind too. But dharma is the nature of re is is just the is reality, and we see practitioners in all different. Uh, religious traditions with incredible wisdom, incredible kindness. And I think that's what we're really touched by when we see these practitioners are very kind, compassionate people, you know, really caring and wise with it too. Because the reality is, is one, really. The way we describe it, of course, many, <laughs> many different takes on that. So I hope that, uh, so I hope that uh, is enough for with the person who was uh, talking about converting and becoming a, a lay teacher, uh, that's, that's possible in, uh, in uh, 
um, in Buddhism, uh, there are many famous lay teachers, as that person will be aware of. And uh, the basic thing is that in order to become a teacher, one must have something to teach <laughs> from one's own experience. So that's, that's the only thing. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. There's one last question. I don't know if we have time to properly answer it. Yeah. Um, after my children grew up and moved out, I feel alone and empty. Is there a way to find that feeling to want to live and have a meaning in my life? Yes, yes. Yes, there is. You know, the, this is an interesting thing. When, we, when our meaning or purpose in life is just the children, uh, when they've gone, then people will, can feel like, uh, what's the point, you know, the, the reason for them living? Usually, actually, before they know it, the grandchildren come along. <laughs> so, so they're soon, soon involved, and I think some, some, some grandparents think, oh, no, or, you know, as I say, running a, a, an unregistered creche <laughs> for, the, for their, their children. But, yes, if your meaning and purpose in life is just the children, then, of course, when they've gone, that will, they will feel like there is a void, there's an emptiness in our life. But if we are interested in dharma, if we're interested in life, then we see that everything, our, our, our journey in life, as it were, people use this term, is to learn from life, to find out what it's about. And this can become, you know, the focus for us. And in a Buddhist term... In Buddhist terms, you know, the meaning and purpose can be to develop really good qualities in our minds and hearts. So to become a very kind, caring, generous person, these things can become uh, a purpose in our life uh, and to help others as a consequence. And also to develop that wisdom, you know, understanding of what's going on, what's life about. Um, and so this, this can become what we are, uh, the motivation, the purpose for our living. And I know uh, meaning and purpose is very important in our lives. And uh, Viktor Frankl, who wrote that uh, wonderful book, Man's Search for Meaning, about his experience of in the concentration camps in Germany during the Second World War, he noticed and he built a whole, a whole uh, area of psychology based on it called logotherapy, that if we don't have meaning, if people in the concentration camps didn't have a meaning for continuing to exist, to live, they soon died. <laughs> and he gave some really striking examples of people who their, their belief, uh, their, uh, the reason for living, their purpose, gone, and they just died very quickly after that. So very important that we do have a meaning and a purpose to, uh, in our lives because it will keep us going and it can keep our uh, mind focused on investigating, looking at what life is about. So. Thank you for that, and I think now, maybe that's the last. So for those who would like to, we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, and please come along for the uh, communal meal next door. Thank you. <laughs>